Hello, everyone, and welcome today to our uh, webinar organized by the Clean Energy uh, Business Council. Uh, thank you for taking the time and being uh, with us today. Um, our expert today will be uh, Dr. Nasser Saidi, Chairman of the Clean uh, Energy Business Council, Dr. Carol Nakle, from CEO from Pistol Energy Company, and the event will be moderated by Melanie Nohona. Senior Editor at uh, The Economist. Uh, I'm uh, Sophie Collet and I'm the Managing Director of the CBC. Before um, giving the floor to Melanie, uh, please just, uh, uh, I will shortly introduce you to CBC uh, to present you what we do and uh, uh, who we are. So who we are, uh, the CBC is a non-for-profit organization and we are representing the private sectors involved in the clean energy uh, sector across the MENA region. And our goal uh, is really to establish uh, the dialogue between the public and the private sectors. Um, you can go uh, ahead and we are um, providing uh, advocacy we are bringing some uh, raising awareness in these sectors and thought leadership for the sector we can move on uh, ahmed and to um, do this uh, goal to reach that mission we are uh, organizing uh, and conducted several activities first we are running a range of uh, three different working groups such as Future Mobility, uh, Energy Efficiency and Climate Finance Group with a specific roadmap and deliverables and events, and also two different programs for school and for women in clean energy. Um, we are running a, a sort of uh, um, workshops, event, conferences, and drafting also some uh, policy papers. Um, just to uh, give you a, a quick overview of the membership portfolios we are having. So we are having more than 120 members uh, in a very wide landscape, as you can see. And we are also developing a series of partnerships, uh, whether with local organizations, international organizations or initiatives. So uh, just uh, as an this is the organization as of today, so very um, mean structures. And if we move on, Ahmed, please. What I wanted uh, to really say to you, just a short, no, just a short uh, and last message is that really every uh, company or entity or individual that are looking to do business in the clean uh, energy or renewable energy sectors uh, in the region, uh, is really uh, welcome to join the CBC and uh, me or uh, Ahmed uh, will be very happy to have a co specific conversation with you and, and, and discuss on how we can uh, engage you within our organization. Now, please, I leave the floor to Melanie to uh, start uh, the event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophie. Um, so, as Sophie mentioned, I'm a senior editor with the Thought Leadership Division at the Economist Intelligence Unit. That's the research arm of the Economist Group. Um, and we really explore economic trends and sector trends um, to create content for policymakers and business executives. And obviously, what we're seeing right now is that the issue that's top of mind um, for this audience is the economic impact of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. And I think particularly in the GCC and the MENA region, what's of particular importance is the uh, impact on oil prices as well. So over the course of the next hour, of course, we will hear a lot more about this, the economic impact and the trends in the energy sector from two presentations. Um, and then that will be followed by what I'm sure will be an engaging conversation with our two panelists. Uh, really looking at what this means for the transition to clean energy. Uh, now, before we get started with our presentations, I just want to share a, a couple of quick notes to our audience. Um, the first is that we are keen to hear your thoughts and your questions. So at any point over the course of the next hour, um, please use the question box in the panel on the right side of your screen. 
to share your questions with us. Uh, a second note is that um, over the course of this hour, we will also have a few polling questions uh, and we would be grateful for your participation. Uh, your participation will only enrich today's discussions. So let's get started. Uh, and so the first presentation um, is on the economic consequences of COVID-19 uh, and the impact on clean energy delivered by Dr. Saidi. Dr. Saidi is the chairman of the Clean Energy Business Council um, and the president of Nasser Saidi and Associates. Dr. Saidi, over to you. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Sophie. And uh, thank you for having organized uh, this webinar. Uh, like many organizations across the world, uh, we are starting to move into a virtual world. <clears throat> Previously, we would have invited you all to a physical uh, seminar. Now we're all becoming uh, virtual in many ways. And perhaps this is what might happen in the future. So the way we've designed the way we've designed uh, this webinar is it's really in two parts. I'll start off talking more on the economic aspects of the COVID pandemic, what are its consequences on a global basis, and then across sectors, and some implications for the energy sector, including a little bit on clean energy. Uh, but I'll leave most of that to uh, my colleague on this panel, Dr. Carol Nachli. Uh, who will be focusing much more on the energy and clean energy aspects. And then together, uh, hopefully, we'll, we will answer some of your questions. So let's let's get into it. And as Melanie was saying, if you have questions, uh, just just send them uh, in, in, in the box and text us. Hopefully, this thing works. Hmm. Let's see. Okay, did I do that or somebody else did that? <laughs> okay, that's that's the agenda. <clears throat> so I'm going to start off at a high level in terms of pandemics and, and their economic impact. Um, what's significant about pandemics as compared to epidemics or other forms of contagion is that they have both supply and demand shock effects and there's feedback from those on the, on the economy. In this case, um, governments across the world have responded with stimulus and we'll discuss some of the stimuli and, and responses. This wasn't the case, for example, with the uh, Spanish flu of 1918. So here we have a very different world where governments have come in and responded. And the third part will be looking at the economic impact of the pandemic. And next, where are we heading? What sort of recovery will, will, are we likely to get? And is there going to be a different world coming out of this pandemic? A bit of time in terms of response. Um, this is a picture you're all familiar with. Um, that's the John Hopkins map of, of the COVID pandemic. Uh, we are now 3,670, 3, maybe more, with close to 360,000 deaths probably by, to, by the end of this day. And as you can see, um, the map is red all over. I would only comment at this stage that you'll see that much of the red has been in advanced economies, apart from China. Um, and the Middle East, of course, is, is affected. We'll come back to that later. But I would caution that the COVID pandemic is still developing. And Africa and Latin America are still facing the wave of the pandemic. So it is by no means over yet, even if Italy, Spain, France and other have started coming out of their cocoons. Sorry, Dr. Nasser, can you give me one second? Because people saying they don't hear you for some reason. Just let's say. No? Can you can people hear me? No? They can. Yeah. No. I'm going to raise uh, let's see. <clears throat> 
Is that better? I don't know. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yeah. So uh, just to make sure that yes, people hear us. Okay. Yes. Okay. So that's we're getting other... confirmation from the audience that okay. they can hear us. Okay. Okay. So Dr. Nasser, please continue. Okay. I'm trying to move this along. It it seems to uh, take its time. I can control okay. it for you. Yeah, I think it's better that you control it. Sure. So, what sort of economic effects do we have on on of of COVID? Uh, divide those really when you're thinking about it into macroeconomic effects. What's happening at the level of the economy? Uh, what's happening at the level of businesses? And what's happening at the level of households? So, three types of actors, economic actors. At the macroeconomic level, we've got a sharp decline in GDP. This is a supply side effect uh, of stopping production. And as a result of that, uh, investment declines because you only invest if you have future business to look forward to. And of course, there's a big increase in economic uncertainty as well as in health uncertainty. We'll come back to that insofar as households are concerned. But also, uh, once you have this sharp fall in GDP, it means you have a fall in income and once you have the fall in income, it means consumption declines, people spend less. But we're not only there, we're also going to have an impact on the indebtedness of businesses and also in the indebtedness of households. So public indebtedness goes up because governments start spending more and they have fewer revenue, so they borrow more. But it's also the private sector, which is facing a lower income, which also starts getting into debt as well. And in terms of the financial markets, um, investors will go to safety. They will shift away from risky assets and go into less risky assets, such as investment grade government bonds. In terms of the firms, in terms of businesses, there's, a, there's also an uneven impact on businesses. We've seen, of course, the aviation, tourism, hospitality, retail businesses are the most affected uh, because people are not moving. There's, there's no travel, either internally or across countries. And then they're also spending less. We're all stuck at home. Some businesses are doing well, the healthcare industry and people who are providing uh, personal protective equipment, PPE, as we now call it. And e-commerce and e-services seem to have gone up. So uh, Amazon is doing well, thank you very much. Others are not doing, doing so well. But importantly, I think when you're looking at the economic effects, it's the cash flow which matters the most. What hurts businesses is the reduction in revenues and therefore the squeeze on their cash flow. So you have a big liquidity squeeze. And as a result of that, many companies without having the revenue, continued expenses will eventually end up potentially insolvent and bankrupt. Households have a different set of issues. Uh, they can no longer work or they've lost work or they're on part-time work or they're half paid. In addition to that, so they have lower income, they spend less, but importantly, there's an economic, if there's an effect on their health, in particular, mental health. Uh, physical and mental health are, are affected. We don't know what the medium and longer term consequences are, but it is there. People get depressed. We know suicides increase as well. And of course, job losses are there. People are no longer able to pay their rent, uh, even pay for electricity, water, and other utilities. So a major impact in terms of households and as a result of that, uh, consumer sentiment and confidence in the future diminishes. So the main issue as we move forward is how do we exit from economic hibernation? What is post-COVID going to look like? Next slide, please. And okay, most of you only maybe took Economics 101. So this is Economics 101. There are two curves, a supply curve and the demand curve, AD0 and AS0, they meet. And that's where you have Q. That's so Q is for production, V is for prices. 
the supply shock means that the supply curve shifts up and to the left, yeah? And you can see it hits the demand curve, less demand as a result of, of the supply curve. So quantity goes down and prices initially might go, go up. But then as a result of the supply shock, people have less, fewer, less income, they spend less and businesses invest less. So total demand goes down to AD1 and therefore quantities produced go down to Q double prime. And this goes on until you continue in this dynamic effect of feedback between supply and demand until you end up at Q4, right? So this is the sort of dynamics that, that we are now living. Uh, a supply shock becomes a demand shock. The demand shock then translates into another supply shock, which then translates into further demand shocks. So these are the sort of dynamics we are living today and different economies are at different stages in terms of these dynamics. Next, please. Now, Melanie was asking about uh, the transition and where are we heading? Are we moving towards some form of recovery? This is um, a very important simulation that was done by the Bank of International Settlements. Um, so they're simulating the effects of the global pandemic on the US, the Euro area, the other advanced economies, including China and the emerging economies. Now you see they've divided it up into two types of, um, of recoveries, potential recoveries. One is what we call a V shape in blue and, and a, a W shape, uh, which is where you go down in red, where you go down in terms of decline of GDP much more, and then there is a longer time to recover. Now, importantly, I want you to note note the following the emerging markets will have a deeper impact on their economies part of the reason is that the governments in those economies don't have the fiscal space don't have the ability to stimulate their economies like the economies of the advanced economies in europe or the united states that can spend more and borrow more um, if you're a country in, in africa or latin america you can't borrow a trillion dollars uh, the way the United States is doing right now. They're going to be borrowing close to $4 trillion. So the impact is likely to be much harder on emerging economies. And it's a theme I'll come back to a bit later. The other important thing is that no country is immune. So the contagion is spreading across the globe. Nobody is going to escape the deep recession. But let's see what governments have done and what sort of impacts. Next slide. If you look at the G20, and the G20 of course represent more than 85% or so of global GDP, they're offering uh, fiscal support. Much of it is going to businesses, some $6.3 trillion worth of fiscal support. And it's spread across different types of policies, um, reduced taxation, social policies in terms of social safety nets, uh, providing extended unemployment insurance, providing for wages. Um, much of it is credits and loans and guarantees for businesses. Um, regulatory policies in terms of imposing fewer constraints on bank lending and encouraging more lending to the small and business enterprises. Helping small and business enterprises, SMEs, is critical because those are the most vulnerable to demand and supply shocks coming off the epidemic, the pandemic. And at the same time, they live with less working capital. They have less access to the banking sector. So overall, um, if you look at it, the fiscal support has mainly gone to businesses. In advanced economies, in particular Europe, they've tended to help households a bit more, uh, even more so than, than in the United States. And the main impact really is 
number one, make sure that you have your health systems being able to perform, and second, to prevent propagation of the pandemic across more sectors of the economy. Let's just dig a little bit more into this in the next slide. So if you look across countries, what have been the, the, the types of policy responses? Uh, fiscal measures, which we mentioned, central banks across the board are giving a lot of liquidity and credit. Uh, look at what the Fed has done with what the ECB have, has done. Um, a lot of credit being pushed into the economy. The advice to banks is to help businesses restructure their debt so they don't become insolvent and then bankrupt. Um, home repossession, bankruptcy procedures, they're trying to suspend those. Uh, how can you pay your rent if you don't have an income? Uh, you don't want to get people out in the street by repossessing their homes. So a lot of effort is going into those types of measures. Interest rates are at a historical low and they're being cut. Um, both Europe and the United States are doing what we call QE, quantitative easing, buying corporate bonds as well as government bonds to in introduce liquidity into the market. However, uh, there's still um, not a lot of cooperation on a global basis. They're trying to help constrained countries by which we mean uh, the most poorest countries of the world by giving some debt relief, in particular on payment of interest. However, as I point out at the bottom of the slide, the problem is it's not so much liquidity. Uh, it's not so much providing you more than mortgage refinance. The point, the point is that you will not venture out and businesses will not venture out however much liquidity you have, if you're always worried about your health and there's a threat to your death as because of the pandemic. So the basic issue is one of confidence in the future, not so much the availability of liquidity. Next slide. So what sort of impact has there been across countries and by sector? Let's dig into that because that's important for looking at where we're heading in the future. Next slide. This is the latest uh, estimate uh, from about two weeks ago from, from the IMF. Uh, the IMF is saying that this is the worst economic downturn we've had since the Great Depression in 1929 to 31, 32. So we're talking about a cumulative loss, as you can see in red on the right-hand side, uh, of about $9 trillion. But that $9 trillion uh, estimate by the IMF is also based on a V-shaped recovery. In other words, you're going to rapidly recover from the pandemic. That is still uncertain. So take that as being relatively optimistic. As you can see on the left-hand side, uh, if you look at the IMF's estimate, you have a strong resurgence in 2021. At the global level, uh, you go from a decline of minus 3% in 2020 to an increase of 5.8% in global GDP in 2021. Um, the same is true for the advanced economies. They go down sharply by minus 6.1% in 2020, recover 4.5. But notice that although you're down 6.1, you go up 4.5, you're still losing, right? That's the reason why you have this big red on the right-hand side. And the same story of V-shaped recovery is being made for the emerging economies. But again, this all is predicated on having this V-shaped recovery. Next slide, please. If you look at the... Um, Total, therefore, this is now going in country by country. We don't have time to, to go into the details of that. But on average, what we're saying is that um, countries will be about 5% smaller in terms of GDP by 2021. Yeah, so this is going to be a very sharp decline. Number two, no country or region is going to be spared, whether it's advanced or emerging markets. 
So even if your government has spent a lot of money, uh, it might help you maybe recover a bit faster, as we saw, but it doesn't mean that you're going to be spared the economic recession and potentially a depression. But there's also an additional challenge for emerging markets. Um, many of them have seen capital outflows from them because, again, investors become risk averse. So what do you do when you're risk averse? You withdraw your money from emerging markets. You take it to the advanced economies because you consider there is less risk. So we've seen billions coming out, more than 100 billion coming out of the emerging markets. But that also means that those emerging markets don't have the ability to access debt markets and capital markets to help their economies. So their currencies are under pressure. They have limited fiscal space to act. And at the same time, many of them have high debt levels. So if I think around our region, you've got countries like Oman, countries like Bahrain, including countries like Egypt, countries like Iraq and others, let alone the Sudans and the Yemens and other countries which are facing conflict, uh, they don't have the ability to react as quickly. They don't have the fiscal tools or economic policy tools. And the final point about this V-shaped recovery is that insofar as the pandemic is concerned, it is still unfolding in Africa and Latin America and some of the countries in Asia. So even if Europe and the United States start recovering, what you might have is a second wave of the pandemic coming back. And the pandemic itself can change. The COVID virus can mutate. So this is why a lot of people worry that you might have one wave now and you might have a second wave by September. Yeah. So this is why I don't buy the V-shaped recovery. Next, please. And of course, the primary sector that has been affected above all has been the energy sector. So this is the International Energy Agency forecast uh, and, and looking at the impact uh, in terms of the, the decline in global demand. Uh, you've seen a, a very sharp uh, decline in, in global oil demand because of less transportation, because of less aviation, uh, less energy use globally, manufacturing is closed, industry, etc. So you're seeing a very, very sharp decline. But uh, the IEA is also looking a little bit at this V-shaped uh, uh, recovery. But notice one thing that already demand was growing slowly before COVID because global, the global economy, global economic growth was declining. So already there was low demand for oil to begin with. And in addition to, and that is what led to this, to, to OPEC having to reduce uh, their output supply, trying to preserve prices. Unfortunately, prices, of course, didn't respect that. They continued declining. And then we had a price war uh, between uh, Saudi um, and Russia. And I think Dr. Carroll will, will come back to that. So I won't spend too much, too much time on that. So what you're talking about is probably the biggest shock the oil industry has seen in several decades. More important in my view is that this assumption of a V-shaped recovery may not hold. So the impact on oil price may likely be more persistent and not simply a temporary price decline. Next slide, please. And if you look at uh, our region, what it means for, for our region, again, I want, there's lots of information on the slide that will be distributed later on. The important, most important thing, I think, for the countries of the region is that you're facing three types. It's a triple whammy for, for the countries of the region. You've got the COVID effect, the supply and demand COVID effect, yeah? You've got the oil price crash, um, which for many of the countries that are highly reliant, on oil as a source of government revenue, 
and as their main export. Yeah, this continues to today. The oil producers are highly dependent on that, going all the way from a Saudi or an Iraq or an Algeria or others. And in addition to that, there's a financial market shock on, on the countries of the region. There are two types of financial shocks. One is that they are major investors abroad, right? Through the sovereign wealth funds and the investment funds, and those have been affected by declines in the stock markets and losses on investment. But in addition to that, they may no longer have access to the financial markets because the financial markets are now supplying credit and liquidity to the advanced economies. So many of the countries of the region that might want to come back to the markets and they have lots of debt coming due may not be able to refinance themselves as easily as otherwise. A final comment I would make at this stage is that it's not likely to be confined to the oil producers. Once income declines in the oil producers, and we're talking about a deep recession, the sort of recession we're talking about in the GCC countries and the oil producers is much more than 5 and 6%, I think. It's going to be much deeper than that. We don't know yet, but we know two things. The oil shock transmits itself to the non-oil sector because governments, when faced with lower revenue in our region, cut down spending, and they've already started cutting down spending. So instead of get, having anti-cyclical fiscal policies, you have pro-cyclical fiscal policies, which make the recession even worse. And in addition to that, it gets transmitted to the non-oil sector, because much of the non-oil sector is actually government spending to begin with. Construction, infrastructure, and all the rest is highly dependent on government spending. So that's one impact. So the oil shock is not just an oil shock, it's also a non-oil shock. But second, and importantly, for the other countries of the region, you have an impact on remittances and investment out of the oil producers into the non-oil producers, okay? So much less trade across the Arab world, much less investment and the reduction in remittances to the labor exporting countries, Morocco, Jordan, Lebanon, and others, Egypt that exports their labor, their labor. So the impact also is on them. So they get a transmission from the oil producers. So for the labor exporters, there's not only the effects of COVID and the global economy, there's the effect also of transmission from the GCC and other oil producers. Next slide, please. And of course, as you know, um, trade has been declining and is likely to decline by close to maybe 25 to 30 percent in, in my view. So if you look at uh, the trend, the, the dotted line on the left hand side, uh, we're way, way be below trend. And even if you're very optimistic, uh, you'll only get try to get back to that lower trend line maybe by 2022. On a pessimistic scenario, uh, you, you're going to get a continuing decline by at least 15% of global trade. And of course, what you mean by global trade is that if you're not able to export, uh, there's less demand for your product. So let me illustrate how important this, this point is. China, for example, today is starting to recover. So factories have started again, people have started working. China depends on exports, and it depends on exports to the European Union and to the United States. But if there's no demand in Europe and the United States, who does China sell to? And therefore, this is the trade engine is going to play a critical role in any form of recovery in the future. And the other illustration that we know very well is the aviation industry and how it got hit. Look at um, the right-hand side panel. So world flights are down by more than 80% uh, and 90%, I think, in, in April, May. The airlines uh, are losing something like $10 billion in cash every month. So basically, the airline industry will not be able to recover very quickly 
all of them will need governmental help. And they've all gone cap in hand requesting uh, aid. Next slide, please. The other major thing that we need to look at is employment. Um, and here I'll go quickly on, on this, but simply to say um, something like 68, 81% of employers across the world are in uh, countries that have required workplace closures. Um, that means that um, at least 47 million to 50 million employers that's more than 55, 54% of all employers are operating businesses in the hardest sectors. So they're going to be laying off workers and cutting down their salaries. And probably most important of all, there are at least 1.6 billion people working in the informal economy uh, globally across, across the world. And once you work in the informal economy, you, know, you don't have access to a lot of government help, subsidies, and cash. And the result of that is going to be a massive increase in poverty, a massive increase in inequality, including extreme poverty, and in some cases, potential famine. Many countries can no longer import food and the food supply chain has been disrupted. So what we're looking at is not just a deep recession, potentially a depression. What we're talking about is humanitarian crises starting in some countries. Next, please. So what sort of re recovery? I think it is still open. Uh, it could be, I think it's very optimistic to think of a V. It's even more optimistic of thinking of a Z or Z type recovery where you recover like a V and then you go up, you make up for uh, what you lost. Uh, to my view, my favorite is B, a B, like the letter B. So you go down, you stay flat, maybe for a long time before you, you recover. And what I worry about a lot for the future is the loss of human capital, right? Because of health, lack of employment opportunities and moving forward. Next slide, please. Now, has anything come out <laughs> that is a silver lining from all this? The answer is yes. If we look across the world, uh, we live in a cleaner world than we did before. Our air is less polluted, our water and the rivers are less polluted, etc., than, than before the lockdown. So if you look at traffic congestion, it's gone down tremendously. Next slide, please. And this is a picture I think you'll have seen on your TVs and, and elsewhere. You can now see mountains where you didn't see them before. Yeah. Uh, you can see uh Cities, uh, Venice is, is clear. It looks like the paintings we used to have in the past. Uh, look at Delhi. Uh, you know, it, it is across the world. And importantly, one of the pieces of evidence that has come out of COVID is that there is a relationship between contagion and how much small particle pollution there is in the air. The more polluted your air is, the more likely you are to get uh, COVID. Yeah? This is important for the future because one of the messages needs to be that handling pollution is also one way of combating viruses and particular pandemics such as, such as COVID. And that health message needs to be transmitted. Next, please. Look at China, however. Uh, China pollution nearly disappeared in February, but now it's picking up again. Uh, look at look at the results in, in April. The red, the red has come back, and it might come back quickly. Next slide, please. Okay, so we now I think we, we're at a crossroads. Um, 
path one is you've got lower oil prices and you've got government stimulus to highly polluting industries. What that means is that you might invest less in clean energy and clean technology, right? So you go back to business as usual and a pre-COVID path, which means that the energy transition might be derailed by COVID because of all the stimulus that has been given. How are you going to convince people to buy an electric car? Good question. The other path is a Green New Deal path of saying, ah, on the contrary, we should now move to a new world which is less polluted and therefore we decarbonize power and road transport. Um, we focus on energy investments, uh, energy efficiency investments. Uh, we remove subsidies, in particular energy subsidies, because the oil prices are low anywhere. Anyway, so why provide why provide subsidies? And also, you don't give bailouts to high carbon, high energy, high polluting polluting industries. So I think we are at, we are at the crossroads. I don't know where where we'll be heading. How will people's behavior change? We don't know that yet. Certainly, I hope that we'll go for path two. But if we know the history of the human animal on Earth, the human animal on Earth is not very rational. So they might simply go back to path one. Next slide, please. Next. Okay, so some questions for a post-COVID world. This is my last slide. Um, will people become more conscious about their carbon footprints? Uh, we're going to ask ourselves, do we need to travel as much? And if we don't need to travel to work and we can travel, we can do things virtually, do we need all that office space? And if you don't need all that office space, what's going to happen to it? Do you really need to travel so much but for business, air travel. If not, what are you going to do with all those planes and the airports and 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 related? Okay. Um, what are you going to do about food? Food is going to become a big issue because food supply chains have become disrupted, and countries may very well turn around and say, "Well, I can no longer leave myself open to food disruption. That could lead to political and social problems." So I want to try to grow my own food. You might revert towards more nationalism and we're seeing move towards deglobalization and greater nationalism in economic policy, even before, uh, even before Trump, yeah? But a lot of that is happening. So we don't know what this post COVID world will look like. Uh, our hope is that uh, it will return us back to of the paths we wanted, that is an energy transition towards a cleaner uh, global economy. Thank you. I took too much time, I know. I'm sorry. Uh, but Thank but you, Dr. We're Saibi. We're, we're having fun all together, so we might go a bit We longer. are, we are, and it's always wonderful listening to you. Um, I think it's time well spent. So thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I, and I think I think you really set the scene for a, a conversation about energy demand uh, that segues very nicely into our next presentation. Um, before we um, before we move on to the next presentation, I would like to launch uh, one poll question. Um, uh, Ahmed, if you can please help me out and launch the question. There we go. Um, will the coronavirus pandemic accelerate or decelerate the transition uh, to renewable energy? if I can request all the participants to answer the, the poll now. I can see the responses coming in. Thank you very much for your participation and we'll close it in just a few seconds. And just a reminder as well, um, please do continue to send your questions in the question box on the panel on the right. Um, we're, we're a little behind time, but we'll definitely uh, try to squeeze in a couple of questions from the audience. <laughs> 
All right, thank you very much, Ahmed. Um, our second presentation today um, will be on the current state and outlook of oil and gas markets and the implications for energy transition by Dr. Carol Nakhle. Um, she is the founder and CEO of Crystal Energy and Energy Consultancy. So Dr. Nakhle, over to you. Thank you, Melanie. Hello, everyone. I hope you can all hear me clearly. Let me first of all get over the technological hurdle and see if I can um, control the slides. Ahmed, do I have control over the slides? Okay, I control them for you. Yeah. Um, if you can give me the control, that would be better because there is some animation somewhere. Uh, but sure, anyway, done. yes. Um, so what I would like to cover with, with you in the time that is, has been allocated to me is give you an overview of what's happening in oil markets without going to the details, otherwise I would need much longer than 15 minutes. Um, but also see how that translates into the energy transition. However, I know everybody is today focused on the pandemic and how this is affecting our lifestyle, how it's affecting energy demand, how it's affecting um, perhaps um, energy transition. But it, it's worth taking a step back and look at the conditions that were prevailing before the pandemic because if you have weak foundations if you have something not working quite rightly the crisis of course was going to affect all sectors across the board but it's going to hit mostly in where your foundations are weak so it's very important to see the conditions that we had before the crisis and if there were any signals that you know we would we should we shouldn't have been surprised about what happened later on when the crisis hit some people talk about unprecedented and i use this term a lot unprecedented and historic but actually uh, did we ignore some signals and then when we're talking about the future um, are we really starting from a new page or are we going to continue the trends that were prevailing before the crisis hit let me first start by um, sharing with you something you are all familiar with. Um, and of course, the slides are not responding to my um, touches. So, Ahmed, I don't have access. Let me see if I can quickly do this. Ahmed, if you can slide. hear me. Yeah, I, I'm unable to move the, the slides. So I'll have to ask you to do it. Which, uh, um, if you don't mind to move on to the next slide, please. All right, Ahmed is not listening to me either, so nobody's responding. Yes. Anyway, so while waiting for the next issue. slide, just one second, yeah. For um, what I wanted to show you on the next slide is um, the decline in oil price that we saw earlier this year, and everybody was talking about this unprecedented collapse in oil prices. Of course, if you look at where we started a year ago, so if we look at January uh, 2019, so where we are today is definitely in a very low uh, oil price environment. But did it really come as a surprise to all? Let's look a little bit at uh, a little bit longer than what happened last year. So next slide, please. And this for me is, uh, I can spend hours talking about the slide and tell you the reason behind it. But let's go back to um, the, to, uh, before 2014. So in summer 2014, what we had was um, a high oil price ban. So we had the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, and as a result, prices collapsed, but then they quickly recovered. So we saw a rapid ramp up in prices, and not only they recovered to um, the pre-crisis, but they reached record highs in a sense that over several years, so between 2011 up to summer 2014, they were hovering in the range of $110 a barrel. Then came summer 2014, and then they went down. And um, afterwards, we saw in between 2014 and 2016, prices hovering in a quite low region. And then came December 2016, we saw one of the biggest, perhaps uh, the biggest then partnership in the history of the oil industry that was OPEC Plus, where we had uh, OPEC joining forces with non-OPEC producers led by Russia to implement production cuts, remove some of the oil production excess production in the market and then achieve a, an upward pressure on prices and they they managed originally they said they would have the deal for six months as effective as of january 20, uh, 20, uh, 2017 
but then they um, kept on renewing that kind of partnership and the terms were revised accordingly up until uh, March this year. Now, if you look at, at the success of OPEC Plus, of course, their success has been quite notable in, attempt, in, in, in the terms that they managed to put a floor to the oil price. So prices did not continue their downward uh, slide and they, they recovered. However, there was something else in the market that uh, changed fundamentally the way oil markets function. And this is still a supply side story. That was the advent of the share revolution in the US and North America. So we saw a new supplies coming up to the market, but not only as new supplies, but much more flexible supplies. So for those of you who are not quite familiar uh, with, uh, with oil, uh, with the oil sector, uh, what, the majority of our production comes from conventional oil, from the traditional oil. Um, but shale oil, we call it unconventional, and more accurately tight oil is more uh, is unconventional, um, in a sense that the supply responds quite rapidly to changes in prices. So when prices increase, we see additional supplies coming on stream. When prices decrease, we see shale being the first to leave the market. So they have within months. You see, whereas conventional oil, they take a much longer time to respond to changes in market conditions to prices. So we see the supply, the production of conventional oil responding but quite slowly compared to tight oil. So what we had here, we had the success of OPEC Plus, managed to put floor to the price, but every time there was an upward pressure on prices, we saw new supplies coming from the US, from shale oil, and this kind of put a lid or a ceiling on prices. And during the period between December, uh, January 2017, up until very recently, up until the pandemic um, of the corona, uh, virus became more notable, we saw oil prices moving into that corridor. Now, why I'm mentioning that? Because remember some of the things that happened this year, and remember also an important geopolitical development happening earlier this year. So last year, for instance, we saw several attacks on oil tankers in the blood artery of uh, oil trade in the states of Hormuz. We saw even major attacks on Saudi Aramco facilities in, in the kingdom, and yet the oil market barely took notice. This would have been something unheard of a few years ago. So if you look, for example, in the early decade of the century, if, some, if any kind of tension in the Middle East would have sent oil prices soaring. Please stay with the previous slide, Ahmed. And then what um, earlier this year, in January this year, uh, we, we saw that uh, there was a killing of General Soleimani, the Iranian general, on Iraqi soil. And then many people expected oil prices to spike because of the rising tension and still the market did not take notice. So this is just to give you some indication, some flavor that markets, oil markets change fundamentally. They used to be quite responsive to geopolitical tension. This kind of dissipated um, in the last, in the, in, in the more recent year and kind of um, uh, prepared to uh, the, the kind of situation that we saw when the pandemic of uh, coronavirus became much more uh, notable. So between January and April or, or early March, let me, let me stop a little bit at March 2020, people were still expecting oil demand to grow, albeit at a slower rate. So we were still expecting a positive growth in oil demand, and it was a healthy growth. Yes, a little bit slower, but people thought that the COVID-19 was an Asian problem, was going to be remain confined to Asia, and they expected oil demand to slow down by a few hundred thousand. However, OPEC Plus met in uh, March 2020, and they uh, actually was started with OPEC and they decided that they needed further cuts to support prices because they were falling further, uh, but nothing really drastic. However, OPEC Plus failed to reach an agreement because Russia did not want to introduce any cuts. And as a result, we saw prices going downhill in free fall, as I showed you in the uh, previous slide. Uh, next slide, please. Now, at the same time, so that happened at a time when the OPEC Plus deal kind of collapsed and everybody was um, um, allowed to produce as much as they wanted. And the Saudis you know, said that they would put in the market the equivalent of a new North Sea, UK and Norway production combined. Plus, they sold, they wanted to sell their oil at uh, discounted prices. So you had massive new supplies coming into the market. So there were no more restraints, but at the same time, news and data about the size of the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on global economies and as such on oil demand started to become more notable. And that's why I have here on the slide, just if you look at these forecasts in terms of demand destruction, 
And actually, interestingly, they happened in um, uh, so the, uh, over time, like from milder, I mean, it's not mild, but relatively speaking, when I say minus 4.3 million barrels a day destruction, that the, those kind of estimates were quickly, um, uh, they, they, they simply turned um, uh, minuscule in a few days or a few weeks. For example, we started with a, uh, an expectation of a demand destruction of 4.3 million barrels a day or 5 million barrels a day. And then the latest uh, expectation was then for April, the IEA, the International Energy Agency, saying, oh, hold on a minute, we're expecting demand destruction of a staggering 9.3 million barrels a day. And why this kind of worsening scenario? Why I call this a race to the bottom? So it's definitely a demand story what we are facing today in oil markets. Um, and it led OPEC Plus to reconvene and to agree a production cut of 9.7 million barrels a day. Um, but it is important because Today, it's not an oil story. It's not an oil market story. It is a global economy story. So we have the pandemic affecting global economy and in turn affecting the oil sector. So if you go to zoom in only on the oil sector, we're going to have only a very partial side of the story. If you want to understand what's going to happen in oil markets, what's going to happen next, then you have to really take into consideration what is going to happen with the global economy. So treat all these numbers that I like this demand destruction scenario. And I showed you how I mentioned earlier, how the forecasts were quickly revised. For example, the IEA only in February, they were still expecting demand to still grow. And yet one month later, they hit us with this massive destruction in demand. So treat any kind of forecast, at least until the end of uh, this year, with a, a big uh, a pinch of salt, because no one really knows how the outlook for the global economy is going to look like towards the, at the end of the year. And even if I quote the IMF, which refers to the current situation as a crisis like no other, and it calls it the great lockdown, even the IMF revised its um, forecast for economic growth quite drastically within a question, within a matter of one or two months. So they were still expecting earlier this year, the global economy to increase at three point something percentage, percentage point, and then uh, by April, they revised that downward by six percentage points. So really a massive change in forecast. And because um, uh, the global economy affects directly energy demand, particularly oil demand, and here in this case, we're talking primarily about the oil uh, the, uh, transport sector where oil is king, then definitely that translated in the kind of demand destruction that we are um, hearing. Where does that lead us in terms of prices? I really don't know, but I like to look at what happened in previous um, uh, episodes of oil price crash. I know that history does not repeat itself, but it often rhymes, to quote Mark Twain. And if I look at previous oil price collapses, um, and probably they were a little bit milder than what we are see seeing today, but it often takes um, a while, you know, really more than a year, for prices to recover to the pre-crisis level. And because we are dealing with a crisis like no other today, we shouldn't really rush into making um, uh, ambitious and op uh, optimistic forecast about a recovery in oil price. I can, I can go through the details of what is this on the supply side outlook about the inventories, but I leave it there uh, for, for now, and maybe we can leave it for the questions. Let's. Uh, move on now to what does this mean for the energy transition I'm ha i have a new hobby these days i used to wake up when i uh, was in london at the moment i'm currently stranded in in the uae but my base is in london so i would wake up and rush to my work you know catch the train to make it on time but these days i have the privilege to read the uh, bbc news stories in the morning and other of course uh, media outlet and it was amazing how many articles this morning were on COVID-19 and the green recovery and climate change and whether we're going to go back to normal, what does this current situation mean for the energy transition? So there's definitely a great interest into this topic and lots of question marks. But again, let me take you back to um, what, happened, uh, what, what happened before. People, when I, when I was talking a few days ago about the potential impact on the energy transition, Ahmed, please stay with the previous slide. The, um, uh, somebody referred to the rapid growth and in investment in renewable and uh, particularly solar and wind energy post-2008 crisis. But remember then we had a quick re recovery across the board, so it wasn't just 
uh, renewable energy, as I mentioned earlier, oil prices also quickly recovered and they reached very high level re quite rapidly. So everything kind of recovered. And that's why if we compare the situation today with the financial crisis in 2008, we're not really comparing apples with apples. So the conditions are uh, quite different between the two. But I would say here, when it comes to the energy transition, a lot depends again on the shape of the economic recovery. So if we're having, a, if you're expecting a V-shaped recovery, so maybe some life will go back to normality and everything, you know, will go back to normal investment in renewable energy uh, will pick up again, as is investment in other sectors, including oil and gas. But if you're expecting a new shape recovery or any other of the shape of the recoveries that uh, Dr. Nasser mentioned earlier, then the picture looks more uh, hazy, more uncertain. And irrespective of the shape of, of recovery, I think that we have to take into consideration here an important point that's not going to be business as usual straight away because today renewable energy or green projects in general, including renewable energy, will be facing tougher competition from fossil fuels where you can see prices bottom low. I mentioned only oil, but we have similar story in natural gas markets, for instance. Um, so that is something to bear in mind. The second question is where investment will come from. I know some people are talking about oil companies uh, maintaining their dedication to green agenda. Ahmed, can we go to the next slide, please? And um, uh, for example, Total, BP, even despite their um, uh, drastically pessimistic financial results that they published recently, these companies maintain their commitment to the green agenda. I'm not talking about the other companies, I just want to stay with the oil sector here. But let me show you the reality before COVID-19, and I will let you make your judgment about whether these companies can deliver or not on their promises. So even before COVID-19, the IEA published earlier this year a study about um, oil companies and the energy transition. And according to the IEA's uh, estimates, they uh, found that between 2015 and 2019, less than 1% of the total capital spending of the leading oil and gas companies were made on projects outside oil and gas. So this is roughly just over $2 billion since 2015. Now, if you add the numbers and you use some estimates by other consultancy firms, such as Wood Mackenzie, you see that if this trend continues, and again, I assume we, we, we didn't have the crisis then, we didn't have the pandemic, uh, that we are facing at the moment, that would still be a far cry from what is needed, like around $350 billion of investment by 2035 to really make the energy transition, at least within the oil major, more meaningful. So we are really very far from uh, what has been promised. And the energy, the current, current crisis that we are facing, the corona uh, pandemic, in my opinion, is not going to make this look any better because capital has to come from somewhere and capital is extremely constrained today and it's going to be allocated to um, where companies believe in the most sustainable long-term best risk-reward balance. Next slide, uh, please. And then the third element that I would like to discuss here um, is the fact that even before the COVID-19 pandemic, the world was facing rising income inequality. And because energy constitutes a relatively large share of the expenditures of the low income households, in some parts of the world, when government tried to implement, let's say, carbon taxes, or they wanted to make fossil fuel more expensive, they witnessed all sorts of unrest. So, Ahmed, please press enter four times because these are just pictures from uh, of protests around the world. I think many of you are familiar with the Gilets Jaunes in France, uh, where people were protesting against increase in the prices of fuel. So bear in mind, this was happening in a healthy, if you want, economic situation. What about today with the COVID-19 crisis? I fear that all of us will be poorer in the at least coming year. And I think this is going to affect your choice in terms of where would you spend your money on. And that's why it's very important to look at the relative prices and cost of various fuels and uh, the com that will affect the competition between them. However, as I mentioned earlier, treat all kinds of um, 
forecast with caution. Uh, I just want to show you a slide which I um, just to amuse you about how we can get things quite wrong. Uh, these are a couple of books that were published in the first decade of the century where many were predicting the end of cheap oil and the people were saying that's it, we hit the peak, uh, peak oil supply and now we're going to start killing each other because the world is going to start run, to run out of oil. And what the next decade showed was exactly the opposite of what many people predicted only a few years ago. So be careful with making forecasts beyond maybe five years, especially in a very uncertain environment today. But let me conclude now with uh, zooming in a little bit on the Middle East um, and hi just highlight a couple of challenges I find the region facing, not just economically, but in terms of energy. We tend to think of the Middle East as a region which is the least perhaps economically diversified in the world among the oil producers. That is perhaps true if we look at the region as a whole and among the major oil producers, we see a great dependence on oil revenues. And that's why we, we heard about the negative impact of the current crisis uh, and the subsequent decline in prices on the economies uh, in this region. But this is not, in my opinion, the only problem. It is, of course, a core problem. I think this is what we should tackle first. But when we talk about energy transition in the Middle East, we should bear in mind something else as well. That is the lack of energy diversification. So on this slide, I looked at both, not just the net oil exporters, but the net oil importers. And you can see that the energy mix of the region, MENA region, so Middle East and North Africa, is quite straightforward. It's purely oil and gas with very few exceptions. Next slide, please. And if you zoom in on the oil producers in the Middle East, you can see quite obvious in front of you that the region heavily relies on oil and gas to produce energy. Next slide. And this is quite in sharp contrast with what's happening in, in, uh, elsewhere, particularly when it comes to electricity generation. So this is a region that perhaps consumes the most of oil in terms of power generation. Then there is, we have uh, gas and a very little bit of other fuels. Next slide, please. So that's on the energy diversification. People talk about moving on with renewable agenda. We have to bear in mind that if in this region, we're starting from a very low base. So we have to be careful when we're setting very ambitious targets and ask ourselves, is it going to be reasonable? Now, I'm going to link the two stories of energy diversification, and economic diversification. This slide here, I know there isn't much we read into it, but for those of you um, who don't have much background in economics, for instance, this is taken from the IMF. And just to give you the flavor uh, about the massive problem that this region faced, this is the purple line. And mind you, this was published be before uh, the pandemic became quite notable. Uh, so if the oil price is where it is, it was perhaps in March, let's say just around $30 a barrel, you can see that all the um, uh, MENA region, the oil exporters, would be running a, a uh, budget deficit. Now, it's not a surprise, but what is also interesting is that they have been facing the situation even when oil prices were double where they were today. So again, another testimony, uh, testimony of um, what uh, this region faces. So uh, to, to link the two stories about energy diversification or lack of it and the lack of um, uh, economic diversification, I fear that in this region, if you want to pursue ambitious energy transition agenda, you are going to invest more in oil and gas, not less, because you need the oil revenues to sustain uh, the investment in, uh, in renewable energy. Next slide, please. And one last worrying, a grim uh, conclusion I'm going to share with you about this region is that even pre-crisis, the IMF published in January this year an interesting study about the fiscal sustainability in the GCC region. And they said, it was, it was really for me uh, um, uh, amazing, that they said that even if oil price, they assume an oil price of $55 a barrel, real terms, and they said that under this kind of scenario, the region's aggregate net financial wealth would turn negative, would be depleted by 2034. And if oil price goes down to $20, the net financial wealth would be depleted by 2027. We're talking about really the largest oil producers in the world. So this is where, in my opinion, 
instead of being, of course, energy transition should deserve, I mean, deserve to take priority in all our debate, but we shouldn't lose sight of the more important um, aspect, particularly for this region, that is economic diversification, which in my opinion has acquired a new sense of urgency under current situation. And if I want to conclude with a little bit of optimism, typically low oil prices encourage um, economic reforms. The danger is that once they recover, all those reforms tend to dissipate, disappear and dissipate. So I hope this is not going to be the situation today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nakhle. I think that was a, a fascinating presentation. I apologize to the audience. I know we're behind schedule, but I see strong attendance. Um, I think the insights from both presentations have been fascinating. Um, and uh, I would like to keep the discussion going for a little longer, just so that we have some time to, um, to talk through some questions and also respond to some audience questions. Um, just to start off with, Ahmed, if you can help me uh, show the results of the, the poll question that we asked. I'm very curious to see where our audience uh, is sitting on that. That's interesting, 54% accelerate. So quite, quite a bit more optimistic, I think, um, than I would have expected and possibly my own personal opinion. Um, perhaps we can get a response from our panelists to, these, to this question. And I want to fold in a question from our audience member, Mansi Desai, who's asking, um, what do you think is the government's role and responsibility in moving towards a green deal? So I think taking into consideration this question, um, our poll question as well, and, and, and Mansi's question here, I think it'd be really good to understand first, perhaps from Dr. Saidi, you know, how can governments in the region stay on this path to clean energy? Dr. Saidi. I think if you if you look at the economics of it, um, as Dr. Nakhli was talking about a bit earlier, the high dependence on oil and gas exports and for revenue means two things. Uh, first, lower oil prices means they have fewer accumulation of international reserves, so their financial position deteriorates. And of course, their fiscal position also deteriorates, the large budget deficits which means they have to borrow more. So it could go either way, but I think the incentive now is to export more, right? I mean, if you've got the, if you've got the oil and gas, try to keep up your revenue and therefore export. And that means you should remove internal subsidies to oil and gas, which you don't need at these very low oil prices, and therefore focus more on renewable energy as an alternative to oil and gas produced energy. So the incentive there would be to continue with renewable energy and clean energy projects. The other point I would make is that increasingly renewable energy is of course highly competitive. So if you want to build a power plant today, you're much better off using solar, wind or other, particularly at a time at which battery costs are declining rapidly. And therefore, you also have an incentive on the supply side to turn towards renewable energy. The latest we've seen is 1.35 cents per kilowatt, right? Very competitive compared to what you would get from fossil fuel. And the final point, I think, is as a result of the declining costs and increased interest in renewable energy, not by the big majors, no, by new companies that can come into the renewable sector is that much of it is private sector financed and is attracting more and more private sector finance <clears throat> and therefore less dependent on government, okay? So if I want to look to the future, government should be making more space for private sector participation, right? In energy projects, particularly in solar and wind, where the private sector has the expertise, government does not have the expertise in terms of these new technologies. So if I want to be a little bit optimistic, I would say the combination of those forces, the high competitiveness, increasingly high competitiveness of renewables, plus the private sector increasingly interested, look in our region, for example, at aqua power. Um, it's not only starting to use renewable in our region, it's become an export industry. 
So what I would say to the governments of the region is three things. Cut out your subsidies. You don't need to subsidize fossil fuel any longer. Use the savings, use the savings to go into renewables. And three, create more space for the private sector. If you don't want to finance it yourself, let the private sector go ahead, but open up the capital markets so that more of those investments can be financed through the capital markets. And I think it's a perfect opportunity to do it today. But of course, I'm biased. I mean, I'm trying to sell you clean energy. So. No, but thank you very much, Dr. Said. I think those are three very concise strategies that will be useful to our audience. Um, I do want to ask Dr. Nakli a question um, just about what government interventions we um, can expect to see in the energy sector now. And, and in our previous discussions, we've discussed um, the role of gas in a way as a bridge fuel. It would be really great to hear a little bit more about that, um, uh, uh, if you can respond to that. Yeah, I mean, only before I respond to that, I have to warn you that I will have to leave in no later than 10 minutes, really, that's as, as much as I can uh, sure. stretch it because of another commitment. Uh, but let me respond, first of all, about gas uh, as, as the bridge fuel. Gas gained extremely a lot of popularity in recent years because it emits less carbon dioxide than uh, either coal or oil, uh, especially if you look at it on a per kilowatt uh, hour basis. So it's, it, that's why people said that it's going to be the transition fuel bridging our current uh, energy mix, which is dominated by fossil fuel, to the age where our energy mix is dominated by uh, green energy. And I kind of subscribe to um, this kind of uh, perception because definitely gas has lots of uh, attractive features. It's widely available also. Um, but it's still, at the end, it is a fossil fuel. However, as an economist, one thing that I always ask myself, I say, okay, what, what, what is the price? What is the cost? You see, because if you look at the uh, of evolution of our energy mix, if you go to more than a century, you can see that there are different factors that come into play. But I would say the price signal and the relative pr uh, prices of fuels play a very important role in terms of encouraging or discouraging switching from one fuel to the other. And natural gas, unlike oil, competes with every other fuel in each of its applications. So give me one application of gas that comes to your mind and I give you a competing fuel. So this is where the future of gas, it's not just a linear um, uh, forecast. So we say definitely it's a good fuel because it emits less CO2 and therefore it's going to, uh, to increase uh, and overtake other fossil fuels. We have to see how it competes with, with other fuels. And today, mind you, um, uh, there is perhaps a silver lining for natural gas because natural gas markets were also hit by the same forces that hit oil markets. So with natural gas, we don't really have a global market yet well established like oil. So we look at regional markets. Um, but uh, gas prices also fell over the cliff and we, they might stay low uh, for the foreseeable future as long as the crisis is not over and the recovery doesn't uh, kick in. On government role, I would like to bring in a different dimension in terms of what governments do to accelerate or decelerate the energy transition. I want to bring you back to the oil sector. And again, if you look around the world, I mentioned earlier the, the Middle East and North Africa's dependence on oil revenues. But think of poorer economies, think of Sub-Saharan Africa, think of other economies in Latin America where the dependence on oil revenues is quite high. Uh, it would be very difficult for these governments to simply let go. On the contrary, we're going to see something um, like a kind of a, a repetition compared to previous trends. And I call this the swinging pendulum in the government's attitudes, where governments might become actually much more lenient towards international investment in the oil and gas sector. So we already heard countries revising their fiscal terms, revising their licensing terms to make investment in their oil and gas sector more attractive. Venezuela is looking into that, Equatorial Guinea, even the US wants to support its, um, its shale industry and its oil industry more broadly. So it's not just about this enthusiasm about energy transition. Government are still dependent on oil and gas and they are revising their fiscal terms to make their, to, to attract the increasingly scarce capital into their, their country. And we should not really overlook this kind of trend. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. And I know that we're coming to the end. I just want to squeeze in one more audience question um, from uh, a 
a member, Hitesh. So, and this is really a, a conversation about electric vehicles. So will, whether the thrust on electric vehicles uh, across the globe coupled with low commuting um, travel will have long term. Sorry, it's not phrased correctly, but I just want to know what the outlook for electric vehicles is because that's such a core component uh, of uh, energy demand. Dr. Saidi, would you uh, like to answer this one? Well, I think it, I'll leave it open to everybody, but I think there are two forces at work right now. Uh, one force at work, which is affecting the automobile industry globally, is lower demand for transport. So if we're looking at demand for automobile registrations and production at the moment, it's down 60, 70%. On the other hand, if you look at the stock market, you look at the price of a Tesla, right? Tesla is now worth more than GM and Ford put together um, before the, a, a certain tweet, right? <laughs> but the the view the view was that the future is towards electric vehicles, and I think that is likely to continue. I think there is a big unknown. I think people will come out of this pandemic shock with maybe a different world outlook than they had before. I st I'm still looking at that as a positive. In other words, we cannot know what changes in behavior will come out from, from the pandemic. I cannot predict that. And it's not so much a matter of prices. What we're talking about is a shift in demand curves. In other words, people wanting to go towards cleaner modes of transport. So if I were to take a bet, I would bet that the future is much more for electric vehicles. And the pressure is on countries, particularly countries like China, will be countries that will move towards more electric vehicle transport based systems than before. In the very short run, of course, they'll want to pollute, they'll go back to their polluting ways, coal mines, etc. That's true. But I think the change in behavior is not something we can predict. I think well, people will want to go towards more electric vehicles. The question will be the relative cost of usage of electric vehicles and the relative cost at purchase price. Yeah? Purchase prices are declining, but they're still high compared to your conventional car. We're getting more production. So the question is, will you get more at lower prices and will you be able to supply them with charging stations on a national basis that type of infrastructure investment that might be delayed now and this could pose a problem for the growth of electric vehicles in the future melanie let me please uh, conclude with um, with a few points on electric vehicles Again, let's put this discussion into context uh, and look at the data and the numbers. I know that electric vehicles were increasing rapidly. However, we should we should look at from what base. So we're talking about a couple of hundred thousand, maybe a million, but we're talking about the wider conventional intercombustion engine, and I'm not including the other transport uh, mean. It's really in the billion. Uh, size. So that's why we have to be careful in terms of interpret, interpreting uh, growth rates and the base we are starting uh, from. But I'll give you, uh, and there, of course, there are lots of attractiveness, uh, attractive features surrounding electric vehicles, but we should be realistic in terms of their contribution to ch to, towards the energy transition and towards changing drastically the oil demand. And there was an interesting study two years ago that showed that if you improve the efficiency of the internal combustion engine car, which is a, the car that we most of us drive, then you would achieve a bigger demand destruction than if you put on the, in the market another million or more than that of electric vehicle cars. Because mind you, with conventional cars, the efficiency is very poor. We're talking about 40% of the fuel is being used, the rest is being wasted. So that is something to bear in mind. And I will finish with one anecdote. When I was doing some research on electric vehicles um, a few, uh, two years ago, I read the whole article and, they were, and the conclusion was that electric vehicles would become a, a widespread acceptable mean, mean of transport in the next two years. And I got excited because I wanted to buy an electric vehicle, but then I thought it was strange that nobody mentioned Tesla in that article. So I went back and I checked the date of publication of that article and it was 1977.
so again, this just to put into uh, perspective sometimes our enthusiasm versus what is happening in terms of forces on the ground. And again, you know, I really hope I'm entirely wrong in terms of data and then we all move to a greener future, but I'm also conscious of the number of people living in poverty. I travel a lot into some really poor countries where they are still wondering where they would get their next meal from. That's right. Thank you so much, Dr. Mackley. I think that was a, a, a great anecdote um, and a good, great note to, to wrap this session up. Uh, I think uh, we got some valuable insights from the session and I hope our audience feels the same way. Uh, thank you once again for all those who stayed on. I can see again a strong number that are still on. Um, thank you for your time and thank you to uh, Dr. Saidi and Dr. Nakle for your uh, engaging insights. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. And just as an information, if you want to join the next webinar organized by GCBC, it will be next week on the 12th of May for the impact of COVID-19 on the energy efficiency markets together with the International Energy Agency, Dubai uh, RSB and uh, Smart uh, Automation Energy that will uh, give us uh, insight. So please join next week.